the world. Today, we are going to talk about uh, upright intention. Following the sequence of these lectures and trying to comprehend the intention the goal or the objective, we will say, of uh, the absolute, because that's precisely the goal that we follow. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. You will hear this cough uh, here and there once in a while. So. Are you see in the previous lectures when we talk about upright view, and this is related with wisdom, and upright intention is uh, together in order to point the goal of every monad. Obviously, the intention that uh, every monad has is related with the wisdom, with the knowledge that we have to acquire in relation with the self-realization of the being. So, intention has to be the source, we will say, of willpower. Because if we have an upright intention, then, of course, the development of uh, the infinite capacities of our own particular monad are acquired or could be acquired. In uh, esotericism, we have studied that uh, in order for the Ein Sof, the Absolute, to acquire self-realization or to attain the degree of uh, Paramartha Satya, which is the complete development of all of those uh, infinite capacities which lie in within every monad, for that the absolute develop what uh, the master explains uh, in detail in his book, the Revolution of Belzebub, which are the seven rounds or seven cosmic uh, days which are developed within the Maha Mambantara, which is a great cosmic day. You see, for instance, uh, uh, Maha Mambantara is a great cosmic day in Sanskrit. Maha means big or great. But within this uh, Maha Mambantara, we have seven Mambantaras, which are called rounds. Rounds of development. Because each one of them is related with seven. Uh, root races in every race with seven sub races in every mambantara in every round the first uh, round is developed in the mental plane 
And then the spirit, the monad, descends into the astral plane with the next mambantara, or manifestation. And then into the ethereal plane, which is the fourth dimension. You see, we have here two developments in two, dimension, in two dimensions. The fifth dimension, which is the astral dimension and mental dimension, are within the fifth. And then the fourth, which is the ethereal. And the physical, which is in which we are right now. <coughs> so, from the physical, we return into the ethereal from the ethereal into the astral, and to the astral into the mental. This is what you see, the intention of the absolute in order to acquire self-consciousness or self-cognizance. Because descends into the matter, and from the matter goes again into the spirit, into the abstract. But that dissension, of course, implies the development of organisms made of uh, different types of matter. Mental matter, astral matter, or called also molecular matter, then ethereal matter, and finally this physical matter in which we are. For then to go up again into the ethereal, then into the astral or emotional, and finally into the mental. With that dissension and ascension, <coughs> we see then that the monad, the spirit, uh, develops uh, its capacities within the matter, and then returns after acquiring that development into the absolute. And we have to understand that in every round or cosmic manifestation, there is a mechanical, we will say, development or building of vehicles. As the Master Samael explains, for instance, in his book, uh, The Revolution of Belzebub, in the mental plane, everybody has astral body doesn't mean that everybody has solar astral body. Because you know that uh, nature, for instance, right now, here in this physical plane, everybody has a physical body. But it's uh, mortal. It's not immortal. Those that have acquired or conquered uh, the physical plane are those that acquire immortal body physical body. For instance, Master Jesus has an immortal physical body. That is the physical body that everybody in this planet Earth should have. But instead of that, we have a body, physical body, which eventually we, 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 will, loss, we will lose due to the fact that it's not immortal. But we are here in order to acquire that, and that is what we call the self-realization. The monad has to, to acquire that. That's the intention. That's the goal, the objective. Mm. And obviously, uh, Buddhism explains in different details the intention of the monad. We say, for instance, that the upright intention comes from above. It's the will in which the monad is developing that, and in which the essence has to fight the intention, I mean, the upright, and against to fight desire, which is the mechanical forces in which we find also different type of intentions or goals, but have nothing to do with the monad. In between, that fighting against desire, a development of the right intention, 
which is the self-realization of the being, we develop compassion. <coughs> That's precisely the virtue that takes us to the self-realization of the being. But that compassion is upright intention. The people misunderstand this in different ways, what compassion is. And it's because we always analyze with the ego. A lot of people that think that they are uh, developing or acting with compassion. But uh, the being is not acting there. In order for us to act with the right up, uh, upright intention, which is compassion, is precisely uh, through the development of the being, because he's the only one that can develop that type of virtue. And remember that we are the essence, the buddhata, part of the being, that has to develop that. So, that's the intention, as we see, of the Ainsaf, the Absolute. But obviously, within the Ainsaf, within the Monad, the infinite capacities, as you see, are infinite. And that's why this universe is very complicated, immense, not only physical, but uh, epta-dimensional. When we talk about humanities, we have to understand that we, the Gnostics, we understand. It's not that we believe. When we said we understand, it's because we have experiences of different humanities, not only in the physical plane. There are humanities that are in the fourth dimension, in the astral dimension, in the mental dimension. Worlds in protoplasmic state, which are emerging from the unknowable, and are starting their development. Our planet Earth, in this very moment, is in the physical plane. But before being in the physical plane, the Earth was developed in the fourth dimension. And this is what theosophists call the lunar chain, or the lunar epoch, or the lunar round, in which the anima mundi, which means the soul of the world, was developed in the fourth dimension. But before that, the anima mundi was developed in the astral dimension. And before that, in the mental dimension. Those mental, astral, and ethereal dimensions that we are talking here, or developments of humanity, is what in theosophy is called Saturnian round, coming from the top to the bottom, solar round, lunar round, and now we are in the fourth round, which is called the terrestrial round, the physical. And, of course, we have inherited the karma or the consequences of the different causes which happened in the mental plane, in the astral plane, and the ethereal plane before this earth becoming crystallized in this physical plane. And this is precisely why we talk involution. Remember that here we are not talking about devolution, but involution, meaning the development of the spirit downwards into the matter. But the very bottom of that development is this level in which we are right now, which is a physical level. But the spirit started the, its journey 
through different dimensions, through many mambantaras. After the manifestation of this physical matter in which we are right now, the earth will start going up, returning to the ethereal plane, astral plane, mental plane. Of course, that takes uh, epochs. And this is how we have to understand and comprehend. Because in every level, the monads developed and had to develop certain abilities, capacities. in order to uh, self-realize ourselves. But here's something that is coming into my mind, uh, in order not to forget, I had to establish. The Master Samael Om Beor stated very clearly that the intention of the monads, because each one of us has his own particular monad, is different. We have our own will, but the intention, of course, the goal, the objective is the self-realization of the being, but not all the monads want the self-realization of the being. Most of the monads acquire uh, their development to this uh, involution and, and evolution mechanically just in order to acquire self-cognizance of themselves. Those monads, of course, or part of them, which we call essence or buddhatas here in the earth, they don't feel any longing for awakening or for civilization. They just are content with what they are. Because when you see the world, there are millions, billions of people that have their own particular monad. There are many essences there that are lost already. That the connection between themselves with their own particular monad are no longer in them. Therefore, their intention is just related with the matter. They are not uh, interested <coughs> into the acquirement of this development in order to conquer nature through themselves. They're just happy there by making money, being famous, and following just the mechanical way of nature. And it is because their monad, the intention, the goal, the objective of their monads is just to follow this uh, wave of life in which the Absolute emerges into the universe, descends, and, when, and as I said, through many mambantaras, through the Maha Mambantara, and returns. And they know that at the end of that Maha Mambantara, they will acquire self-cognizance of themselves. That's the only thing. Because nothing is uh, lost, of course. The manifestation of those monads through seven rounds give them that uh, gift, we will say. But their other intentions of other monads during the manifestation of parts of the Absolute, which really sometimes want certain development. They want to conquer certain levels, but not all of them. And therefore they work, as you say, uh, once in a while, the essence receives that strength in, in one life or in one cycle. They are really working their essences in order to develop that because they want to acquire that type of development of their inner capacities. 
But in other times, they really don't care because they already acquired that and they assume that in other manifestations they will acquire a little bit more and they go like that easily until they achieve certain level and they are happy with that. But the other type precisely is related with this doctrine, the doctrine of Samael on Beor, which is for those monads that really want to acquire the level of Paramartha Satyas. They want to acquire the self-realization of the being. They don't want just a little bit. They want completely development. And therefore their monads work their essences constantly without any intervention, I call any interruption. interruption, yeah. All the lights. And it's like a, like a drum, right? A constant working. And obviously, uh, these essences are recognized in this physical world, or in any world, because they are always working in themselves. They work the, 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 that development. They want to become gods. The intention, the upright intention of the monad is precisely superior. And obviously, as you see now, in this universe, that's why there is a great battle. Because those monads that do not want any type of development, that know that eventually they will acquire self-cognizance of themselves, obviously their essences are not worked. Because at the end they know that they will acquire at least that self-cognizance. Not mastery. That's not mastery. Don't mistake that. Self-cognizance of themselves is not mastery. It's just knowing that you are an individual. That's it. And of course, their essences fornicate, adulterate, and they do the things there, and sometimes they're entering into black magic. They're lost. The monas don't care. And others, of course, that once in a while work and not, that do and don't do it, are in between as well. And then the revolutionary ones, they really want, then have to fight and to search for those. <coughs> and that's precisely the big goal, the strange development of the universe in which we are. And that's why in every round or in every mambantara, you find always the outcome, as the Master says, angels or demons. And of course, during that manifestation, karma is developed. Because uh, nobody can enter as a paramartha satya into the absolute. If he owes karma, or if the universe owes him or her dharma, you see, in the master of the law, you are going to enter into the Ain, the unmanifested absolute. You are ready. Then the laws of karma come to you and say, I'm sorry, you cannot leave. We owe you. We have to pay you. And then you have to deal with that dharma. If I receive this dharma and create more dharma, I will be stuck here. You have to be really very awakened and smart. And not, near, not to all, anything. And not, and, and not to, to, to deserve anything. And this is how the Paramartha Satyas enter, very clean. That's why uh, uh, I admire the Master Adoramento, Master Jesus. Because there are many gods there in the universe whose intention is to acquire that, to enter into the Absolute. But still, they develop a lot of Dharma, or they owe a lot of Karma, Katansia. 
So you see, paramartha means absolute consciousness, a very uh, a strong equilibrium, a very balance of the consciousness, strong balance of the consciousness. And this is what we, we are here, working with the intentions of our monad and at the same time fighting against our desires, which are the bad intentions or mechanical intentions from nature, which we are submitted in order to develop that uh, compassion, which is uh, gradual, different levels. So this is important in order to understand because this planet really has a, a lot of karma inherited from the previous rounds. And, uh, and every round we are now, for instance, in the fourth round, which is the physical. I repeat, the first is mental. The second is astral, the third is ethereal, and the fourth is physical. We are now in the physical round. But now we are going to uh, talk about this round in which we are. And we have to state that in every round, or in every manifestation, in every dimension, the anima mundi repeats or recapitulates the previous manifestations. And that's why we say that uh, before the crystallization in the physical world or, of humanity in this physical world or, or, or life in this physical world, the planet Earth in this fourth round recapitulated the three previous rounds the round in the ethereal in the astral in the mental the first root race that existed in our planet earth was we will say astral ethereal that's why it's impossible for the anthropologist or archaeologist to find uh, remnants of this type of root races, because they were not in the three-dimensional world. The Hyperboreans, for instance, which is the second root race in our present physical manifestation, they were still in the astral ethereal. Even the Lemurians in the beginning were manif manifesting themselves astral ethereal way. Every root race is always developed through four yugas or ages, which in Sanskrit are called the Satya Yuga, the Tetra Yuga, the Dwapara Yuga, and Kali Yuga. which is the Golden Age, Silver Age, Copper Age, and Iron Age. In the Golden Age, the innocence is manifested as when a child is born, it's very innocent. Then during the Silver Age, the Tetra Yuga develops, acquire maturity. Then during the Dwapara Yuga, or Age of uh, Bronze, Age of Bronze, culture is developed, civilization, which uh, reaches its peak in Kali Yuga, in declination. That happens in the polar race, which was the first root race that existed on the earth, and also in the Hyperboreans and the Lemurians. But actually, our present root race, in which we are right now, which are the Aryan race, uh, has its origins from Lemuria. And that's why we will say that there are four 
periods that we can count from the of, for the origin of our present Aryan race. You see, the Lemurians were the third root race that existed. And it's precisely uh, in this root race when the Bible talks about that from the waters emerge a dry land. That dry land that uh, the book of Genesis talk about, and we are always mentioning uh, the, the Bible because it's the book that uh, is more uh, known in the Western world. So, during that time, the Lemurians were hermaphrodites. We have to state also that the Hyperboreans were hermaphrodites and the protoplasmatic or protosplasmic root rays, the first one, were also hermaphrodites or, and or androgynous. Both sexes in one body. It was precisely in the Dwapara Yuga, the age of bronze in the Lemurian root race, where the hermaphrodites started to divide in sexes, which is uh, specified in the Bible as. <coughs> From the ribs of Adam, Jehovah Elohim took Eve. As you know, in esotericism, Eve represents the sexual organs. And that's why it is written in that way or the organs of reproduction. We said that Eve, in the time of the hermaphroditism, was male-female, because it was within Adam. But when Eve was taken out of Adam, meaning that one polarity of the sexual reproduction of that hermaphroditism was taken out from, for, for the hermaphrodite. And since woman is related with reproduction, it's always associated with the female aspect. But for esotericism, female aspect is related with reproduction, whether male or female organs. And that's why when the Bible specifies that God or the Elohim, through evolution, took Eve out of Adam, meaning that they were separated in sexes. The two sexes, the two reproductive organs were separated, no longer in one body. And that's why we always state that Eve, everybody carries Eve in their sexual organs, whether male or female, while Adam is in the brain. So there you have that uh, during that epoch, the intention of the division of sexes was precisely to develop a brain because the Lemurians were, uh, didn't have a brain like the brain that we have right now even though our brain is in a state of degeneration right now. The brain of the Lemurians were related just with the encephalus. And uh, the objective of uh, evolution or development of the physical body was precisely for the monad to acquire power over the physical plane. <coughs> it's not possible to acquire power over the physical plane if the vehicle, the physical vehicle, is not proper for it. 
The Mona needs a physical vehicle with a strong brain, a brain that will be uh, very uh, good for the manifestation of the mind, you see, or the intentions of that monad. And for that, the individual needs to develop an illuminated intellect. I mean, an intellect that will be under the service of the monad. So when the monad takes over the intellect, it's written that it takes over Satan, symbolically speaking. Because the intellect, in this case, is that uh, uh, aspect in which it's uh, Satan, in which it always identifies with the physical plane. You know, through the intellect, you acquire power in this society. And the intellect, Satan, is the one that tempts tempt Jesus. It says, worship me. And obviously, that's precisely the intention. Obviously, the initiate in this path have to follow always the monad, the internal Jesus, we will say, inside of us, our own spirit. In order that the intention of our own monad is to work with us as essences in order to acquire power over the intellect in this physical plane. Just the beginning of this. But the intellect is identified with the physical plane, with the senses. And he's always tempting us to follow his intention or its intentions, which are related with desire. To conquer the intellect is to conquer Satan. It is written, you have to serve your Lord and to obey your Lord, which is the monad. But he is always there during the path of the initiation. Tempting the initiate. The initiate uh, receives uh, offerings in many ways in order to, to be a powerful Lord, as you read in the Bible, that they want to proclaim Jesus king or president, governor of the world. But he's always rejecting that. Because all of this is a world that is passing. And you have to conquer nature, not to be a slave of nature. So in this path, we have to remember always the intention or the goal, which is the self-realization of the being. But unfortunately, it is written that with the development or the division of the sexes, as you know, the individuals of that epoch in Lemuria became identified with desire. And from that identification, of course, the intellect in the state of development, Adam, uh, fecundated Eve. Or we will say that to the sexual organs, when they discover the orgasm, the spasm, they uh, begat Cain and later Abel, the two children of Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel is a separatism, you see, from the hermaphrodites in which humanity started to develop the intellect, the mind, Cain, in the wrong way. That is written symbolically, Cain kills Abel, which represents the essence. Because the essence is always under, this, under the work of the spirit. You have to follow the good intentions, or the upright intention of your monarch in order to develop a right brain, and to conquer the brain. But the lack of experience, and because, as we said in the beginning, not all of the monads went the same thing, was a chaos. Cain killed Abel, meaning 
that the intellect became very strong in relation with nature. In Lemuria, in the beginning, they were cyclops, meaning that they could see the internal planes better than the physical plane. Their eyes were not fully developed. And that's why we will say that through the evolution of that brain, when the humanity became identified with the physical world, Cain killed Abel. The third eye disappeared. Little by little, of course. Because when we say the third eye disappeared from humanity, we have to understand that it's not from one day to the other. It's a process of devolution. That's why we develop the intellect uh, by sacrificing the spiritual view. You see? That's why in Buddhism, uh, it is uh, like wisdom is related with view and intention. Because the spiritual view, the internal view, is what uh, is a basic thing that counts in this development in order to have the right or the upright intention. But the spiritual view was cancelled, destroyed. And to the expenses of the physical view that are under the power of Cain. And that's why it's written that evil is dead. So we had to resurrect that. But the resurrection of Abel means a process of initiation, which was, of course, uh, effectuated at that time in Lemuria uh, in the Kali Yuga, or that epoch. The masters, the White Lodge, started to work the development to acquire, to acquire that uh, level, which the Bible called Seth, or the third son of Adam and Eve. Because Adam and Eve, in this case, symbolizes Lemuria, the Lemurians. So Seth is the outcome of a revolution. Or we will say, the chosen ones of that time, which were going to originate the fourth root race in our physical plane, the Atlanteans. The Atlanteans will, in the beginning, of course, develop also through the four yugas. <coughs> the Atlanteans had their Satya Yuga, Tetra Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, Kali Yuga. In the Golden Age, Seth established, of course, uh, the goal of the White Lodge. But there were many there, monads, that were destroyed, their physical bodies destroyed, or that civilization destroyed, because many of, the, uh, of those essences were in the state of degeneration. Lemurians were giants. And it's written that after the destruction of many eruptions of volcanoes, the Lemurian continent sank into the Pacific Ocean. But many lands were saved. And those lands, many barbarians, Lemurians, in a state of degeneration, males, more than male, that females, were, of course, devolving. It is written that in that epoch, they crossed themselves sexually with beasts. You have to understand that they were degenerated, fallen, in order to satisfy their lust. 
in front of the cross, the sexual cross of these giants, Lemurians, came different uh, species. Not only the apes, but many others. The apes that we find this day in age are just the outcome of the devolution of those Lemurians who cross themselves with beasts, with animals. And that's why this is how uh, you find the similitude of the genes or, or the DNA of the apes similar to the ones that we have. Matthew Samuel Onveor explains in detail about that in his book uh, uh, Gnostic Anthropology. In this day and age still, there's a lot of uh, arguments about that. There's a common ancestor <coughs> from this humanity and the apes. Yeah, the Lemurians. But it's not evolution, it's devolution. Because those giants, you see now, we are midgets in comparison to them. They were giants. The first outcome of those crosses were uh, creatures similar to the chimpanzee, but giants. They continue crossing themselves with other animals, and finally we have now the gorilla, the chimpanzee, the orangutan, the baboon, and many other monkeys or apes. Apes, we will say, because the big apes come from Lemuria. And it's written that the, uh, the small apes come from Atlantis, at the end of Atlantis. It's always repeated a cycle. So then we have, uh, of course, that every root race has seven sub-races. So the White Lodge, through, of course, I mean, the intention of the Absolute is to develop Paramarta Satyas, conscious individuals. So they continue in their harvesting, in their development. And uh, the seven sub-races of the Atlanteans who develop are the, the first one, the Rom Romals, the Tlavatlis, the Toltecs, the Semites, the Turanians, the Akkadians, and the Mongolians. You have many, uh, read many stories about the Toltecs, for instance, which are written in ancient Mexico, and about Quetzalcoatl, a great master that were there. Well, it was the epoch, of course, at that time in Atlantis, because you have to understand uh, and to comprehend and to see that Mexico existed as a land, part of Lemuria. And when Lemuria sank, Mexico became part of Atlantis. So really Mexico is a very ancient land and you find uh, roots of, that's why you find in certain parts, uh, certain uh, ruins related with Lemurians and another part with Atlanteans. And they talk about the Toltecs. But let me talk about the Semites, or Shemites. That's the word, right? I, I guess it's with Sema, Shemites, you call it, as it's written in the word, right way, right? Because the Shemites really are the origin of this root race, and they develop in Atlantis. Symbolically, of course, Moses wrote that in Genesis. This is that Noah, which is a very Kabbalistic name, had three sons. Uh, in the fourth uh, race, of course, those three sons, we will say, are the three next races that existed from that time, or sub-races. But the first son was Shem, which is, uh, Noah here represents, of course, the fourth sub-race of the Atlantean civilization, which in the Atlantic continent cross, sexually cross themselves with the Hyperboreans. 
supervivor, uh, the survivors, the, super, uh, the Hyperboreans, crossed themselves with, uh, with Atlanteans. And they created that uh, uh, subrace, which is called the Shemites, the original Shemites. Of course, at that time, the White Lodge was planning to form a special uh, people in order to bring great masters and to organize the future root race, the race of the Lamb or the Ram, the race of the Arians, or Arius, the fire, which was. Uh, going to be uh, controlled by Samael, the king of fire. So at that time, the Shemites were prohibited to sexually cross themselves with any Atlantean race in order to preserve the purity of that Hyperborean uh, root race that will be the origin of our present Aryan race. After the sank or the sinking, after the sinking of Atlantis, the survivors, the Shemites, that emigrated to Gobi Desert as symbolically is uh, written there in the book of Exodus. Moses, in this case, represents uh, many of the captains or avatars at that time that were guiding those tribes, Shemites, in order to originate the present root race. Those Shemites, at the, at the end of the sinking of Atlantis, were commanded to cross themselves now with other survivors like the Mongolians were, were the seven sub race but that was after the great cataclysm that uh, sank uh, Atlantis within the waters of the Atlantic Ocean this is how the White Lodge continued its intention its goal of development and then we find that uh, the first sub-race that existed at that time was in Tibet, in the central plateau of Asia, the crossing of the Shemites with Mongolians. And of course, at that time, the white races were guided by the doctrine of the heart. which is uh, the doctrine related with the spirit, the golden age, the silver age. This uh, doctrine of the ram or of the lamb is very ancient. Is it related with the heart, with the sun? It's a solar doctrine. And the white races in the beginning were guided by that about that doctrine. Great kings, Kumaras, as uh, is called in Sanskrit, were guiding those uh, tribes in the beginning of the Aryan race. And uh, that is related, of course, with the doctrine of Christ, which, as you know, is a Greek word, but is related with the same. Christianity uh, didn't start with Master Jesus. Master Jesus brought back Christianity into the world. This is where we have to start, because many people think that Master Jesus started Christianity. In this epoch, yes, of Kali Yuga. But really, Christianity or the doctrine of the Ram is very old, 
very ancient. And then we find that uh, the Shemites from the first sub-race that came down into India and China, etc., they developed, or they uh, developed many branches which are related with the Arabs, Arameans, Babylonians, Carthaginians, Ethiopians, Hebrews, and Phoenicians, who started to extend their influence over the lands of the East. Then the white Hyperborean tribes of the forests of Meridian Europe became slaves of the dark-skinned races. Also, the white races became slaves of the black, in other words, the Ethiopians mainly. They utilize, uh, the black utilize the white for the melting of their metals in order to build their Cyclopean cities. Then the white Aryans liberated themselves from slavery and great battles started between black and white races. This is how, uh, after all, the law of cause and effect made the dark races to become slaves of the white. Of course, the original Semites were different. But we're talking here about the development of uh, this root race. We will say when they were uh, declining or going from the Golden Age to the Silver Age into the Copper Age. Really the Copper Age or Bronze Age that is also called started with uh, Ram. As you see in India, there are many uh, scriptures related with Ram, this great avatar. And Ram was precisely uh, <coughs> from the white race. Ram invaded India and established his kingdom even into, how do you call this uh, island, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, which in the ancient times was Ceylon. Ram and his white warriors invaded India and rejected the army of the black or Ethiopians until Ceylon present Sri Lanka. This is how the dark races lost their dominion and scepter over the white race so that the white can dominate the earth through the centuries. Because coming from uh, the root, uh, uh, the, you say the, the root of the white race is related, of course, with Atlanteans, but also from the Hyperboreans. And they had to, uh, the dominion of the white race should be established in this Aryan race, which is also, uh, was accomplished, as, as you know, right? Because the Atlantean root race, uh, the main color that conquered or the was dominion there was red, red skin. While in the Lemurian you find the black ones, yellow races. Right? This is development through time of this uh, humanity. And of course, during the time of Ram, which is the Vedic. The, this is a, the Vedic uh, time in which uh, there were written uh, books which still exist. It was called the Rig Veda, the Yahur Veda, the Sama Veda, and the Atarva, Atarva Veda. The Vedas, of course, is a transition from the silver golden ages into the copper age and it's still the Vedas I mean and Veda is a, a word that is related with we will say this uh, I mean science the superior science and uh, 
in India, which is uh, really uh, the root of uh, religion, we will say, in the European continent, in Asia, Africa, between the Vedic period and Brahman period, which is the period after the Vedas, because Brahmans were related more with the head than with the heart. The Vedas is with a dogmatic doctrine related with the heart, which ran established in India and all those lands of Asia at that time in order to guide the souls. But then the, the development of the brain established Brahmanism, which was not, of course, a, a skepticism, but a way in which the science or religion is shown more in the reasonable way, the way of the reason. And a transition between uh, the Vedas and Brahmanism, there are books written there, we we'll call the Upanishads, which are an explanation of the Vedas. And of course, from those scriptures emerged in time the Bible of Moses. Because people think that the Bible is a more ancient book of the books, but really uh, the Bible was written because the same stories that you find in the Bible or Kabbalistic meanings or esoteric doctrine you find in the Vedas. And of course, uh, Moses learned that in Egypt because uh, Abraham, which according to this uh, uh, Biblical uh, legends is the father of the Hebrews. He was Chaldean, which also was one of the branches of the Shemites. So this uh, Abraham, as uh, Madame Blavatsky says, A, which is without, without Brahmanism, created a new religion in order to guide those souls which, of course, were already uh, in devolution during that time of, of the Copper Age. <coughs> Brahmanism really uh, created great uh, books of literature, letter with philosophy, science, religion which are called the uh, Mahabharata. From the Mahabharata, uh, we find the Bhagavad Gita. But these doctrines that you see are related with, uh, with the brain. In the sense that, as you find the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is always asking, asking, trying to reason about this and that action. You see, the intention of the monad it's always the self-realization, but the mind always asking, why? Why this? Why that? Right? So you see how from the doctrine of the heart emerged the doctrine of the, of the brain. And of course, during that time of uh, Brahmanism with the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, and many other great uh, literature, uh, emerge uh, uh, in India the how do you call the different levels of the castes because the priests which were inheriting from the Vedas for, from the Vedic period the, the rituals which is related with the heart the priests of Brahmanism or the, the fiery priests, they were performing rituals in the morning, uh, midday, and in the afternoon. 
that was, of course, something uh, related with the uh, great uh, rituals at that time, which were uh, in relation with the forces of nature. But those priests, their sons and grandsons, inherited those type of rituals and were performing them. And since uh, they were studying, of course, the doctrine from the type, uh, the, the, the point of view of the brain, they were dominating uh, the dark races, the yellow races. Those races that couldn't study uh, the doctrine uh, from the brain point of view, they uh, content themselves with following their instructions and establishing the other case, uh, castes, right? Castes, yeah, the other castes like uh, the businessmen and the artisans. And this is how the castes were established in India. And continue, of course, in different ways through the Western world. But still, we find here that the intellect, those that have brain and have some profession, dominate. The whole world, the whole society is dominated by the intellectuals. Hmm. As you see, for instance, these are the, the three parts of the brain, right? Heart is the, the, the first source of the religious doctrine. The good intention, the other are ripe intention. Then comes the brain, and finally the, the stomach. It just follows uh, inst in instinctively uh, the doctrine. So, of course, after that, in India, came Buddhism. <coughs> and Buddhism, of course, was. Uh, in relation with uh, Brahmanism, like Christianity in relation with Judaism. In the beginning, the Brahmins were trying to eject Buddhists from India because they were establishing another doctrine or returning into the beginning of the returning into the way of the heart. Compassion. That happened, of course, uh, like 6,000 years before Christ, before Jesus. Uh -huh. And in Persia appears another uh, master, Zoroaster, trying to establish again the doctrine of the Ram. And it is written, it is stated that uh, this Zoroaster had uh, a great disciple who followed his, his doctrine, whose name was Odin. And Odin, of course, established uh, in the north, in Europe, uh, this doctrine. And that's why Nietzsche and many other uh, writers in Germany was, were following or chasing that line, you know, to Persia with Zoroaster. With one, one of the branches, we will say, in which the White Lodge always wants to uh, establish the intention, the goal of the White Lodge, which is the development and to follow the will of the Ains of the Absolute. So, at the time when Moses came and, and was r really trying to help also establish a doctrine of the brain. But Jesus came in order to return into the heart because we have already a lot of brain. Too much brain that we are sick and tired. There was too much mind. Do we need more development in the mind? We really don't. Right. We need to return. And that's why the White Lodge was establishing that return into the doctrine of the heart, which is solar, different. Unfortunately, there were many castes at that time that were identified 
with the lunar religion. You see, the mind is lunar, in which you have to follow certain laws, etc. Laws, of course, of the race. So there were many, we will say, esoteric groups, schools, organizations related with the heart. We were, that they were acting, of course, in secrecy. And sometimes they were pulling through the doctrine of the brain in order to develop the internal man. But there were always people, of course, that were more identified with the brain than with the heart. That uh, Brahmanism that started explaining the doctrine of the Ram, of Christ, in the intellectual way that started in India, developed very strongly in the beginning of Kali Yuga in Greece, with the so-called uh, philosophers. Socrates, Aristotle, it originated the, in Kali Yuga, the epoch of the age of reasoning, started developing. And of course, little by little, the powers of the heart were lost in the past. So when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, there were a lot of skepticism. And of course, the souls, the masters that came from uh, with him, were prepared in order to reestablish the doctrine of the heart by, of course, gathering all of these groups in different places of the earth that developed in Tibet, in America, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, related, of course, with uh, the development of the brain. So when uh, Jesus approached, as you know, uh, the main uh, uh, caste at that time, that because he was born among the Hebrews, the Hebrews were, of course, against him. Not all of them, of course. When I said against them were, of course, those, uh, uh, the clergy. The clergy. clergy. Yeah. The clergy at that time. That were identified with uh, traditions. Because the real initiates that were born with him, like Peter and all the apostles, that knew that they were coming with him in order to accomplish certain mission. The intention, the upright intention of the White Lodge in order to establish the doctrine of the heart again on the earth. As you know, the development, Jesus was betrayed by those castes of that time. But after his death, Peter gathered, little by little, in secrecy of course, because the persecution, all of those uh, initiates and groups that existed in the Middle East at that time. That's why symbolically, as you know, it's called the, the, the Fisher, but really Peter was not, uh, as people think, that was fishing in the ocean or, or, uh, or a common and current sailor. He was an initiate. In the beginning, he was gathering, trying to gather all of those initiates from, from the Middle East in order to establish the doctrine of the heart, the esotericism again on, on the earth. But you know the development of, of uh, Christianity at that time caused a lot of uh, persecutions. Because they were, uh, at that time, for instance, uh, how you call the, that the fish, ishtu, ishtu. That, that was the, the secret word that they were using in the catacombs among the initiates in order to enter, in order to follow the, the, the doctrine of the heart. Or they return into the light. 
But uh, rumors were there among the Romans at that time that Christians or the initials at that time were, of course, sacrificing children in their rituals. That scandal, of course, the Romans, they were the persecution of the Christians at that time with Nero and all of that. Things that, of course, uh, history ignore. But then, this great initiate, Hilarion. Hilarion IX, who was instructed by the Christ. Symbolically, is written in the Bible how Hilarion found the Lord. That's symbolic. And of course, Hilarion contacted Peter, that was the head of uh, the White Lodge at that time, physically speaking, organizing the uh, newborn Christianity, or the doctrine of the ram again. Paul of Tarsus. Hilarion. That's his sacred name. So Paul of Tarsus, of course, you know, he traveled into Europe, into Greece, and many other places in order to uh, gather all the initiates of that epoch. It's not like many Christians believe that uh, they went there and they were believing in idols and this and that. We're initiates that knew about the doctrine that we're talking here. But uh, they, of course, obey the new law in which the doctrine of the heart has to be reestablished on the earth. And as you know, uh, you read in the Bible all the travelings of Paul of Tarsus, Hilarion, in order to gather all those initiates and form different groups in order to reestablish the doctrine, Gnostic doctrine, or the doctrine of the ram again on the earth. But there were many battles at that time. The intention of the White Lodge is always positive, is, is, is wonderful, but you know, as we said in the beginning, certain monarchs do not care about that. So the essences are identified with traditions and with certain things from the earth. <coughs> so, of course, the caste of the priests were established in Rome. Uh, the priest of Rome declared himself uh, uh, more developed than other priests. Oh, I used there bishops. The bishop of Rome declared himself a pope, and they established a religion related with politics and power. And this is how the Catholicism started. Catholic is a word that means universal. In the beginning, the church or the organization that Peter started with Paul was Gnostic Catholic. But when the Bishop of Rome declared himself better than others and established that political organization with the state of Italy, of course, uh, uh, they established the Roman Catholic Church, which is not Gnostic, but Roman. And they started to persecute the initials of the Ram, the Lamb, which were, of course, opposing the rule, because uh, the goal of Christianity was to deliver this doctrine that we are delivering now to all of humanity. But they start establishing their dogmas and many other, uh, the, the celibacy, for instance, which was not established by Jesus, because Jesus came and established the doctrine of uh, the perfect matrimony, or Maituna. After uh, 500 years of fighting and killing of many initiates that were really trying to help this humanity, and they were betrayed in the beginning. The White Lodge sent another prophet to help. And the prophet Mohammed was born, of course, who came to start to establish again 
uh, the doctrine of the ram, but all, always also betrayed. In the beginning, of course, was flourishing and was m wonderful because uh, the doctrine of Maituna was reestablished again. And there were many crusades against, as you know, the Muslims of that time, the Islam, that were, of course, having the pristine doctrine, of course, of the ram in their hand. But there were many battles. And they saw uh, famous crusades against them. But there are many wise Christians that were in those crusades that instead of fighting and killing those initiates from Islam, were learning from them. And from them came the great alchemists that appear in the Middle East, in Europe. They Raymond Lully, Nicolas Flamel, uh, Paracelsus and many other great uh, alchemists that were working in secrecy for the fear of the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church at that time was of course killing here, there and everywhere all of those heretics, they say, that opposed their rule. But the White Lodge was always working in secrecy trying to reestablish that. And of course, the Catholic Church gained a lot of power and uh, established uh, itself in many places. While in Germany and many other places in Europe where the Aryan race was developing, they were trying to establish the uh, United States of Europe in order to establish uh, the doctrine and to regain power again for the sake of this humanity. Then we find, for instance, this, uh, this monk Luther, Martin Luther, that was, of course, helping uh, the initiates at that time. They were trying to oppose the Roman Catholic power in order to help humanity. And from that uh, movement came the Protestantism, which in the beginning was Masonic. There were many masters there working against the dark forces in order to establish the doctrine of the Ram <coughs> or of the Christ. So you see how the development of the right, upright intention is coming through all history, how many initiatives work in there, how compassion is, is work, how everything is uh, de 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 being developed here, because we are in it. It's a battle, but we have to know how to wisely work in this great uh, battle against the light and the darkness and to develop. But this is how it happened not only in the planet Earth, but in many other civilizations, in other planets. It's always like that. This is how the White Lodge started to work against monarchy. Because monarchy was working together with that religion, Catholic religion in Europe, foreign power. This is how great masters like Cagliostro came into Europe in order to destroy monarchy and to establish the republic. And of course, they gave uh, a lot of power to this soldier at that time of France, whose name was Napoleon Bonaparte, in order to give him power to conquer the Europe and to reestablish and to take the power of the Catholic Church out of the monarchy or the power of the countries of Europe and to help humanity. But as you know, Napoleon betrayed the White Lodge. Obviously, he, of course, uh, 
did something good there that uh, he declared himself emperor without the power of the Pope. But at the end, uh, he forgot about the plans of the White Lodge and he uh, put uh, uh, in the power of uh, Europe, his family, etc. Then the White Lodge took uh, uh, Napoleon II and the third in order to keep ahead with their work, but always they were betrayed. And at the time, of course, of uh, uh, Germany, when the development of uh, the Second World War, <coughs> Hitler appears. The White Lodge always behind it, helping. But of course, there's a lot of powers hidden there, as you know. If you study conspiracies, sometimes are real, sometimes are false. But this is something true behind it. Hitler knew about Zionism, but he mistake and ignored about the real head of Zionism. And he started uh, uh, working against uh, the Jews of Europe, which were really just, uh, how you call, uh, merchants, businessmen, women and children that had nothing to do. He never touched the head of Zionism. On the contrary, the Black Lodge of Tibet, because in Tibet is a Black Lodge, and there is a White Lodge. The White Lodge is headed by the Dalai Lama. The, some writer says that Ram called himself Lam, because Lam, you know, is the Ram. And from that come Lama which were following, of course, the doctrine of the Ram, or the Lamb. But in that organization, because when the light is stronger, the dark is also deep or stronger. The clan of Dagdukpa, which is a black lodge, which opposes the sacred order of Tibet, sent a man to Germany. And when Hitler receives that man, which is called the man of the green gloves, Hitler thought that he was an emissary from the White Lodge of the Sacred Order of Tibet. But meanwhile, he was a black magician sent by the Black Lodge in order to debate Hitler. And he was the one that advised Hitler in the wrong way. He started killing people that had nothing to do. And he was, in this case, following... Uh, the plans of the Black Lodge. And at the end, of course, uh, you know the, the outcome of that. But the battle continues. The Second World War, the hot world, maybe it was said, war, finishes. But the war continues between the white and the black lodges in order to help this humanity, and it still is. Here we are. The Master Samael on the or, after the end of the Second World War, was sent, or sent, I mean, he was sent again in order to give the last opportunity to give the knowledge completely open, intellectually speaking, all the, all the practices, in order to establish the good intention, the upright intention, we said, of the White Lodge and to re-enter into the doctrine of the heart. But we are in the middle of a great battle. It is a lot of black magicians there in Egypt that enter into the Gnostic movements, because there are many groups. We invite all demons of all religions. We invite all demons of all philosophies and schools from the earth to enter into Gnosticism in order to learn how to become angels. But certain demons enter in order to, their, to, to perform their devilish things. And those demons that repent and they want to change, they are the ones that are working. And there has been a, a big battle uh, among the Gnostics. We are here teaching the doctrine. The upright intention, but that comes from the heart, from our being. 
But remember that the White Lodge is always watching us. They get hierarchies. They are always supporting our work. We had to work there, but we had to know that the good intention or the upright intention, the goal of the White Lodge comes from within. Because the White Lodge is a hierarchy that operates over the superior parts of the being, over the two superior centers, the intellectual superior center, the emotional superior center. And of course, we had to fight against the bad intentions, the evil intentions of our five centers, of our ego, which operate in all religions Because the Black Lodge took over all religions of the world. And what that, that Black Lodge means? The ego. So the being is inside. And that's why we have to follow his intentions, his goals, always. It's a hard work. You see how now we are at the end of this Aryan race. And the fourth round, the physical plane, still we have to have another six root race and another seven root race to finish with this physical development of fourth round. And that's why right now uh, we are in cataclysms, revolutions. This civilization will disappear. We are at the end of this Aryan or the root race of Aries. And we have to work very hard because there are dangers inside and outside. Do you have questions? <coughs> I have a question. The um, Semites, of, uh, the Shemites of Atlantis, mm -hmm. didn't many decide not to cross themselves with the other races, and that's where we get how the, the Jewish people are always trying to keep their bloodline pure? In the beginning, in, the, in Atlantis, the Shemites were prohibited to cross because the Turanians were really very bad sub-race. They were practicing a lot of black magic. And their genes, or DNA, we will say, were very bad. So they were prohibited to cross with those uh, people from those other uh, sub races. But when Atlantis sank, they were commanded to, to cross. But at that time, the Shemites, certain Shemites, didn't obey. And they crossed themselves, so they were ejected from that circle of the Shemites. Those uh, ejected Shemites wanted to return after that by obeying the laws, but they were already outside because they cross not only with the Mongolians, but with the other ones. So after the sinking of Atlantis, when the Shemites received the command, now you can cross because we need to form the Iron race, those remnant people from that time continue with the same tradition, not wanted to cross themselves. And those are the original Jews at this epoch that still continue with that. Even though the law had sending them to different places of the earth and only to cross them. But they continue with that tradition of Atlantis that shouldn't cross. And that's precisely, uh, and that they, they sent into the last minute here to America, you see. And you see how the melting cross of races here in, in New York, for instance, or in Canada is happening. But they don't cross themselves, but still are, of course, in the past. The Atlanteans developed, related with the mind, that faculty which is called cunning. And we, the Arians, reasoning. So reasoning is about cunning. But that, those uh, remnant uh, uh, races from the Shemites still are with cunning, and, and they need to develop reasoning.
How is it possible to know the intention of the being? That is, if our monad wants to self-realize or only be self-cognizant. Well, uh, when we like esotericism, we follow this uh, doctrine. Obviously, we are not from those that only want to follow mechanically. Those that want to follow just the mechanicity of nature, those monads, they, their essences don't come here. Most of them, their essences, are atheists. Not all atheists are, of course, from, from, from that uh, level. Because there are many bodhisattvas that are atheists. They are identified with atheism. But, uh, for instance, uh, there are many uh, uh, people there that really do not believe in religion, they don't like religion, and they are content with believing that there is no God, whatever. So there are those essences. But anyone that likes esotericism and wants to inquire into the develop inside, it's impossible to, to belong to the, that level of uh, monads. Right, that do not want self-realization. That's why uh, the mission of us in Austics is to f to search, to look for those essences that wants to attain self-realization. They want to develop into teach Gnosis. But we know that in a way we'll find people that really don't care about this and they will laugh about it. But we have a mission of looking for them. And little by little we are finding them. Because it's short time now. Short time in the, sen in, in the sense that not like in the ancient time of Jesus. You see, the writer of uh, Revelation, right there, whosoever wants to be a uh, degenerator, keep being degenerated. Whosoever this, that, or you read that in, in that book. Because at that time, it still was time. There were, but right now, we are not. Uh, uh, we are in the time of the end. There is no time. So therefore, we had to work uh, hard. And those people who are just like people who go to church, but you know, aren't interested in anything beyond going to church on Sunday, for example. Will those people perhaps have a chance in a future life, or is it that their monad is just not ready for? Yeah, those people that go to church and still believe in God. <coughs> Excuse me, but do not care about or do not understand this doctrine is because their I mean, the development is not really at that level. Or there might be essences that are belong to those monads that do not want self realization. You understand that those good people disintegrate in the abyss in about a thousand years. So to be religious, really. Even if your monad doesn't want to be self-realization, but to be religious is good. Because it's the faster way to disintegrate in, uh, in the abyss. It's only a thousand years. A thousand years. <laughs> because when you come evil, it takes more time. An atheist takes more time to disintegrate because create karma. You know what I mean? That's, a, that's why we, you have to understand that just because you are religious doesn't mean that you are from the revolutionary path. Could be just a monad that uh, are content only by going to church, whatever. You know, at the time they said they will go to heaven. Yeah. Is there a way to like jumpstart your essence to really get it active again, or is it is that based on like meditation and stuff, or is it? Uh, to what? To really like get your motivate your yeah. essence. But you are the essence. I know, but like, can you cultivate? Your To develop, yes, yeah, willpower, of course, to develop the intentions of your monad, you mean. Yeah. Because that is civilization. It's by doing the work. The whole doctrine, not the doctrine, is for that. It says your monad, your monad's intention is a self realization. So you, there's the, all the doctrine. Do it. Right? And for that, you need willpower. And that comes from above as well. Mm -hmm. But also, you have to respect, as I said, respect all of those monads or essences that are content with going to church. As I said, they will go to heaven. Yes, they will go to heaven after passing through the nine layers of the abyss. Right, but what about, I think his question is, what about
what about people who just want more of a push? Like maybe you're not feeling enough of a push from your being and you want more. How do you create that to do more? Just by doing it. By doing it. Yeah. Well, I, well, well, if you find somebody like a guru, a real guru, that will be a blessing. But the master says, to tell you the truth, he says, in this path, if you find a guru, a real master that will be behind you, consider yourself lucky. Because to find that type of beings behind you are very, very difficult. It's very difficult. The case, for instance, let me put an example of Kon Kagyostro. He's a self-realized master, an awakened. He, he, he is skillful in politics. He's the one that portrayed all that uh, declining of the, of the monarchy in France. Thanks to him, we have the Republic. At that time, when he was doing his work, he had one disciple, Geronimo. He's, I hope this is the name, but anyhow, he had a, that disciple. But he was asleep. But he taught him sexual magic, etc., and he was gaining a lot of powers and initiations and degrees. But this initiate had the weakness of talking with another esotericist. And when he talked about sexual magic and the no spilling of the semen, the other initiate, was, which really was not initiate but just an esotericist, was a scandal. And he said that he was wrong, he was doing it the wrong way. That some, some once in a while he can fornicate, sometimes he can transmute, and that's, that was the way. And not the way that the Master Cagliostro told him. So he started then following the advice of this man, and he started losing degrees, initiations, little by little, because, you see. And to have Cagliostro behind you is, is a blessing. It's a big blessing, you know what I mean? But you see how this, uh, it was a slip? At the end, he was uh, doing the stupidities. And that's precisely, that, that's why in this time, the Master Samael says, we deliver all the lectures, all the doctrine in books. Study the doctrine, follow it. If you achieve, good. If you don't, well, you have the, all the tools, you have no excuse. You just have to do it. If the monad is not interested in self-realization, is it even possible for the essence to be interested in this doctrine? If your brain do not command or does not command your feet to walk, can you walk? <laughs> Another question. When a soul is working to achieve internal development, who is the one that decides which path to take to become nirvani or bodhisattva? Is the uh, uh, the essence? I mean, not the essence, because at that time the essence is no longer essence, but is a, a human soul, is willpower, is a human soul with the uh, with the monad. And remember that the human soul does the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. It will be done. So obviously, when the essence uh, or in this case the causal world the Tifred says I want to follow this path is because his inner being also wants to follow that path this part you know the monad is uh, Adman Buri Manas and Manas is willpower yeah uh, the Jehovah Elohim how is that related to, to the higher God <coughs> well Kabbalistically Jehovah, everyone has his own Jehovah within. Jah is the father, and Hava is the mother. So when he said Jahava or Jehovah, he's the father mother within, which is the monad. Elohim is also a, a, a name that is, implies masculine feminine. Elohim means God, or gods and goddesses. So when you say Jehovah Elohim, it's directly related to that part of yourself uh, in relation with creation. But of course, it's a, a Jehovah Elohim in relation with those Elohim or angels related with creation, which work in the world of Netzah, with nature. And there is a Jehovah Elohim, a master Jehovah, that was the higher initiate in the past cosmic day, who 
whose name is Jehovah. So there is many ways we could continue, you know. But when we talk about Jehovah Elohim, we refer to our own internal particular father mother within. Each one has his own. Given the nature of the uh, recurrent cycles that humanity has passed through over the past ages and the many destructions that humanity has passed through at the close of each race, what can we say will be the story of the Gnostics in the coming years? I will tell you in the coming years because really we are developing now and there are many revolutions. This doctrine is acting in a very revolutionary way. <coughs> Every time is different. I mean, different way of spreading, right? So according with the developing of this uh, culture, this uh, uh, civilization or technology, we are also using it. This is how we are using right now this internet in order to help. So we will see, really, what can we say? If this is not the first time a soul has self-realized, is it possible for that soul to take a different path than the last time? No. Well, if, if, if you are a fallen bodhisattva, which means a fallen vehicle of somebody that took the direct path, uh, you will always follow that because that's the will of your God. That's the will of the monarch. The monarch can, cannot change from one path to the other. I mean, when it's for the direct path, it's completely revolutionary. And if for, for any circumstance entering to Nirvana, and then he will feel like not comfortable there. He has to leave because it's not of that level. That's why we say always, uh, Bodhisattva is recognized always. Because he's always trying to help, trying to do this, trying to do that for humanity. Well, Nirvani is a very selfish, it's a pratyeka that uh, only cares for his own development. Pratyeka can switch. Yeah, pratyeka can, s but takes a lot. Do you think that a great catastrophe will happen in our lifetime? I mean, the, the great catastrophe, the, it will happen in different epochs different steps <coughs> because the karma of this planet. Let me tell you one thing. The karma of this planet is so great that we took out of the orbit of this planet is out of the orbit already is out of the orbit orbit. orbit meaning that when other cosmic ships come from other planets and to enter into this physical plane of this planet this planet is not vibrating with 48 lus. It's vibrating with 96. We would say not all of the planet, but the great cities are 96 lus. So meaning that it's like entering into limbo, the first uh, layer of hell. Because that's why you, you understand why we are following certain lus, which are infernal lus. And everybody agrees with everything because we are really uh, no, uh, we are in the physical world, but vibrating with limbo. But really, this planet is out, out of orbit. Because other humanities of other planets are in, governed by 48 lusts. But there's a big, the double here is because it's hell already. And people having physical bodies in limbo is like uh, an extra help. Because with a physical body, you can uh, work a lot. Without physical body, no. And that's why you find uh, great cities like New York, uh, uh, Boston, Moscow, London. They're governed by 96 laws. The Black Lodge is already controlling the whole planet. So on that topic, can you give an example of an infernal law that is happening currently? I mean, that is establishing here. Homosexuality is established in many other, in many countries. That's, that's a law. 
And if, if you talk against homosexuals or lesbians, you are considered, uh, how do you call prejudiced. And it's because in hell, homosexuality, fornication, lesbianism is a law. It's, it's, it's natural. It's okay. No problem. Uh, 48 laws? Mm -mm. So therefore there, you find it here, it's, why are you so prejudiced? Uh, it, it is okay. It's, yeah, yeah, in hell it's okay. Yeah. Returning to the question about the choice of the soul, uh, the question is, so a nirvani, someone who's a pratyeka or on the nirvanic path, can become a bodhisattva, but not the other way around. So a bodhisattva cannot become a pratyeka? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Bodhisattva cannot be a patriarcha because in order to become a bodhisattva, body, wisdom, hokma has to be inside the sattva, the essence. You see? And it's not you, the monad, or the essence that decides to become a bodhisattva. The real one that decides that is Christ because he incarnates in you. While Christ incarnated in you, then you are a bodhisattva. Before that, any nirvana can say, okay, I will follow the direct path. And then the Lord can say, okay, follow. I will watch you if you deserve me. And that's why I had to sacrifice. After many sacrifices, the Lord says, okay, he really wants to walk in the direct path. And he there incarnates because the law of Christ is sacrifice. So once you are a bodhisattva, it's because Christ is, is there, is, is doing the work, helping you see, Christ is that particular ray that helps the absolute. It's the first begotten, the consciousness that helps the absolute to become cognizant. That's Christ. And a nirvana or nirvani does not receive that help. Because in order to receive Christ, you need to sacrifice for others. And to renounce nirvana. Many times. Because you developed, you gain another level of nirvana, and then you, you renounce and go back into hell again. To hell, to help the others. Because when we said here, really to be in this physical plane, helping humanity is to be in hell. We are in 96 last. It's not like in the ancient times that bodhisattvas were walking and helping the 48 last. Like Buddha, Sakyamuni, even in the time of Jesus. But now, the whole planet is in hell. And people love hell. I guess it comes to my mind, and I, I will say that I have an experience one time, not in the physical plane, but in the astral plane, in limbo. And I was observing there that there was no difference between this physical plane and limbo there. Same thing. But I was there in that part where the souls were entering in big waves into hell. And I saw precisely a big group of souls that were entering into limbo of the astral plane. And there was coming somebody there from a certain country that he was, uh, she was, I mean, saying, Hail, hail to the fornication. Viva, she said, because it was Spanish, la fornicación. And it really took my attention. I said, what? They're celebrating that. And they love that. Welcome to hell. And there's a lot of people really that uh, send hells to degeneration. So they are entering in big uh, searches into their peace. <coughs> so 